Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 12 and at verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And so in view of our subject tonight, ladies and gentlemen, why we believe in creation, we want to have a quick look at some of the influences around the teaching of creation. In the last centuries, developments in the field of technology, that of physics, health, leisure, philosophy, have developed at an extraordinary rate. And in view of these remarkable developments of technology and the widening influence of information, there has grown doubt in the existence of one true God. And as theories of evolution and that of natural selection have been explored. And we know this, as the Bible has told us here in Daniel 12, <coughs> that there will be an enormous amount of travel in that time of the end, in the last days, speaking of our days, and there will be knowledge increased to the extent that man's knowledge has increased and information regarding all manner of things has increased enormously, man has found himself more and more trusting in his own thoughts and his own imagination has developed theories by where man have come from and the world itself was made. And there's one thing that's in common with all these surmisings, for that's what they are, theories, for that's what they are, for it is really not a science. All of these abstract ways of thought have one thing in common, and that is they are all void of the acknowledgement of God. A materialistic philosophy has gained ground in the recent times, which explains life in terms of that have left out God and found man himself in control and at the centre of everything. And man himself, especially in the last century, has found himself in control of enormous forces in the development of the arms industry and the space industry, aerospace industry, where he's penetrated previously unknown areas of space. Man has seen himself as the governor of the earth. And by seeing this development into space, man has even stated quite proudly <coughs> that man has conquered space. Men imagine themselves as the governors. But they also see the appalling destruction that comes about by these developments. And it has caused doubt in others to believe in an existent creator who could see such appalling destruction and allow it to happen on an earth on which he controls. In all that man has done and the coinciding destruction which he has caused through the development of such technologies, we must ask the question, what has man developed any more than what God has provided? Man has certainly used the materials that have been provided by the Creator, but has he really created anything new of its own? whereby the theory of evolution claims that creation in all its complexities and diversities from chance and not from the hands of an intellectual creator with a well-defined purpose in mind. In every country, the importance of the Bible has steadily lost ground and has been pushed into the background. And morals themselves have been eroded away and relaxed. And the concept the fundamental concept, a foundation of the Bible, of a heavenly father, has grown dim the principle on the earth today in the natural father of the family. And of course, divorce and the ramifications from the breakup of the nucleus of the family has affected society enormously. Man has generally turned his back on God and the ramifications of such are, can be seen. So we can see that the teaching of evolution and of natural selection and other theories that are not based on the divine Bible have other ramifications outside of their initial intention. 
and has contributed to destroying man's confidence in the existence of one true God. Evolution is not a science. The theory itself is, is false, but there is no way that the science behind it or the theory behind it can be replicated or can be tested or can be proven indisputably beyond doubt. The theories outside of what the Bible clearly teaches are propounded on the basis of implications of circumstantial evidence that really fail to satisfy a truly inquiring mind. This theory cannot provide any answers to the insurmountable problems facing society, and yet but it is itself responsible for the decline of morals in the breakup of society. But the Bible, in contrast, with its remarkable confirmation of prophecy, has been vindicated beyond all shadow of doubt by the amazing fulfilments it can direct to a satisfying way of life that <coughs> provides for the good of humanity, but also presents a hope for the future for those that are willing to listen. And so the Apostle Paul warns in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6 verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, speaking of the teachings from the Bible. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And so the apostle warns here that there is nothing to be gained by the profane and vain babblings and oppositions to the Bible teaching. It is unproven and in itself declares it has missing links, but it is projected on believers and all mankind and is taught as a fact. It is taught as if it is true beyond any doubt, but in all that it does, the damage it causes, one of the greatest is it erodes the trust in God and it completely discredits the Bible, which of course is amongst its greatest crimes. And man has pursued and undertaken various feats. But when we look in the contrast of the majesty of the heavens and the complexity of design and the beauty of creation, it fails to register as something to be compared to it. No man has ever created an electron or the smallest quantity of tungsten. No man has ever created any scrap of copper that are used in the cable and in the electrical components. And so the vast developments in technology, in the electrical, uh, electrical components and computers and, and um, such like that man has professed his greatest achievements in, all these components that have advanced the triumph of man's ingenuity are completely dependent <coughs> upon the elements that he never made but found. And who, of course, put them in the first place? And who gave man the intellectual knowledge? Who gave man the ingenuity to be able to discover, to do? The hands, the feet, the mind. And so it is the creator we need to turn our face and not to the creation of mankind. Consider the human body briefly. A necessary function of the human body on a very regular basis, daily or nightly, is sleep. And without getting sufficient sleep, we become tired and we can become unwell. But why is sleep so essential? By asking a doctor or physician or those in the medical field, you discover that it is not known why we need to sleep. We know it is extremely important that we do sleep. And of course, we know that it restores, it revitalizes the whole of the human frame. We know that it, in that time it restores memories in the brain. Flu uh, fluids are washed through the brain. And some amazing complexities happen throughout that period of recovery and restoration and that we know it is as important as food and deprivation of sleep is extremely dangerous. We are not told why or how it happens or why man cannot function without sleep. 
And with this in mind, we consider the theories of evolution that claims life came into existence by mere chance, came into being by blind accident and just remarkable luck that has given us hands, given us feet, given us eyes, it has given us the function of sleep. This theory, based on luck and chance, is really void of any reason. If you were to take a simple wrist watch and if you observe those intricate movements within the watch of those mechanics there, you can see that there is a design there. You can see that there is a purpose in it all. You can see that even you may not be mechanically minded or understand the functions of each of those little pieces, but anyone can see that there is a very clear design of the shape and the size and the makeup of that piece of a machinery. But the science of evolution, or the science so-called of evolution, would teach us that the watch is manufactured on its own. And it evolved in all the small, tiny little springs and the cogs and the wheels and all the other intricate pieces of machinery evolved of its own accord because it wanted to tell the time for some reason, although it didn't know of itself why it wanted to, but it wanted to tell the time for some other unit outside of itself. And so therefore, working with forces outside of itself and the desire from within, it ultimately became a smooth working watch. And this is what the basis of evolution and other theories that are void of crea the creator of heaven and earth and the instructions and the message he has left for rec on record for us to read. These other theories outside of the Bible cannot be replicated. He cannot have tests against it. And it's really man surmising to get around one blatant and obvious fact, and that of an intellectual designer or creator has made man. One other large achievement of mankind, as we briefly mentioned earlier, was that of space travel. And with the development of the telescope, we can see that our Earth is a very small, insignificant, floating dust, as it were, in unlimited space. And when you look into the sky, you are faced with infinity. And what is beyond space? And what is beyond that? So as we think upon these sorts of problems, it is borne home to us that there is something greater than us here, mortal men. We only have to gaze up into the heavens on a clear night and be brought face to face with this infinite reality. Our nearest neighbour, excluding the moon, which being Earth's satellite, is the planet Venus, which is approximately 39,000 kilometres away. And with Venus and other planets, we revolve around the sun, which is said to be 150,000 kilometres away. The sun is the centre of a little system of its own called the solar system. And the nearest star to the solar system, and it itself the centre of its own system, for every star is a sun of its own right, is some 42 million million kilometres away. And our solar system in which we live, the solar system is a small dot in a vast Milky Way which at night when it's spread across the sky we can see. And those small dots seen, excluding a few planets that are associated with the sun, is a mighty sun controlling its own vast system like our sun. And if we drain our telescope upon the heavens, and for every dot that you might see with the naked eye, you can see another thousand stars, thousand dots like it with the telescope. And the larger the telescope that man produces, the more he realises his limit to his discoveries, and he faces an infinite amount of stars and information out there. Yet all of this is governed by marvellous precision and order, and more meticulous and act and exact than any watch can. But we ask the question, can this be just by chance? So tremendous is the vault of heaven, ladies and gentlemen. The ordinary measurements that we use here on earth are inadequate 
The man adopts the unit of a light year. Light travelling at a rate of 300,000 kilometres per second, if we multiply that by 60 for a minute and 60 again for an hour, again by 24 and then by 365 for the distance within a year. It's the enormous yardstick by which man tries to measure <coughs> the heavens. To measure this enormous amount of area, a huge unit has to be used. Our nearest neighbour with this yardstick of light years is four and one third light years distance from the Earth. And so if the uh, space rockets or the, um, the rockets by that same calculation that were used that landed on the moon were directed to our nearest star, they would take 5,000 years to reach it, long before those who launched it would have lost interest. 5,000 years to reach the nearest star at the rate of the speed that man moved in going to the moon. And so when we gaze into the heavens, we see something of glory and wonder. It is a, it is a reflection of the Creator and it praises Him. The Bible describes God as hanging the world upon nothing. In Job 26 verse 7, he stretches out the north <coughs> over the empty space and hangeth the earth on nothing. It speaks of the circle of earth in Isaiah 40 and at verse 22. We read, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretch out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And so here we can see another testament to the accuracy of the Bible. When these scriptures were written many years before the invention of the telescope, to know that the earth is circular and hanging on nothing. The earth itself, in relation to ourselves and mankind upon it, is an immense planet, but is very small in comparison to the sun. And because of the vast distance from the earth to the sun, when viewed through coloured glasses, it simply appears as a red disc. Its actual diameter is approximately one and a half million kilometres. Life is dependent upon it. Nothing is more interesting than the wanderings of light rays. <coughs> Long journey for light to come from the sun to the earth, speed at around 300,000 kilometres per second. And upon the earth, Leaning on plants and on uh, grass, the, the process of photosynthesis, every blade of grass seizes, it with, uh, seizes the light and the solar heat becomes imprisoned in its fragile organism. Out in the fields where the grass has absorbed the sunlight and from that uh, use the energy from that sun to grow itself, the beasts of the field um, come to eat that grass. And the sun's rays enter into their bodies and become transformed into milk, to flesh or to wool. And of course, finally ending up on our plate or on our forms on our back in the form of clothing. And we can admire the gratitude and the magnificence of the sun which provides what it provides in the rays and what it really means for life and for man. We can respond to the wisdom of God by giving thanks for his wonderful creation and at the same time disproving those of evolution. See the importance of the sun and the dependence of life on earth of the sun. The Lord Jesus Christ himself proclaimed, I am, sorry, in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followed me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. The Lord Jesus Christ, as we say, is symbolised in the Bible as the sun. And as all things on earth, the living are dependent on the sun's rays. And so all those who wish to live, uh, to live forever in the kingdom age, are dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 72 and at verse 17, we read, His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as, the, as long as the sun, and man shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. And as we look towards the heavens and view that mighty forces that God has projected into space, 
we see the tokens of his power, tokens that illustrate his ability to execute his great purpose in the earth. God's power is not limited to that of infinite space, but the here on earth can be used and is told in the last days when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. In Daniel 2 verse 44 we read, The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all kingdoms and shall stand forever. And to accomplish this purpose, God will send the Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth. The Bible speaks of the sun as unparalleled strength and splendour, <coughs> whose fertilising rays bring life to the world. In Psalm 19, King David, like David, likens it to a bridegroom appearing with glory and splendour before the assembled gathering. The sun's great heat, the light, the strength reminded David of a strong man running a race. And he saw it as a symbol of the earth's coming king, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom King David and our hopes are central. And David was a man after God's own art, we are told, to whom God made many promises that are of enormous importance in the Bible. And these are referenced here in 2 Samuel 7 and Isaiah 55. And he loved to contemplate on the, the omnipotence of God and as a creator and what he has revealed in his works. He declared, the works of God are great and sought out all of them that take delight in them. The glory, the strength, the fiery heat, revealing light, the dominant power and life-giving properties of the sun are used as symbols of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is represented as, the, as coming to the earth as the great son of righteousness with healing in his beams. In Malachi 4 verse 2 that comes from. His glory will commence as a new epoch, a new day for the earth when he will shine in the political heavens as a king of kings. His rays of spiritual light will then disperse the gloom and doom of this evil age. He will come as the Bible paints or portrays him as a bridegroom, come to his bride as a bridegroom. In Revelation 19, he will come as a bridegroom to his awaiting bride, and she comprises all those things earnestly sought to live in accordance with the participation of his coming, and join to him in immortality, and live forever and reign upon the earth, as a strong man coming to return to the a strong man to run a race. And this is how the Bible paints the Lord Jesus Christ and his return to the earth. That he will come to raise and to save those who have looked to him. The nation and the kingdoms will serve him and those will bow down to him. In Isaiah 60, in Psalms 2, in Psalm 72, is laid out for us what the kingdom age will be like that we speak of. Let's turn to Isaiah and at chapter 2. We read from verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days. And that's the same last days that we were referring to earlier when we were speaking at the beginning about the enormous um, information or knowledge being increased and the travel going to and fro. In these last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top <coughs> of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so here we can see that mankind, many nations, all nations, many people, shall come up to Jerusalem to be taught and to learn of the things of the Bible and the ways of God. For mankind, in an, without the influence of the Bible, is very void of the understanding of God. And speaking of this King, the Lord Jesus Christ, which in the Bible is typed as that sun, that bright and shining star that sends its rays to the earth to nourish and give life to all. It tells us in verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, 
And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And friends, we can marvel at the enormous complexities of creation that are silent testimonies that the earth truly was created and hasn't come about by mere chance. The human body in its intricacy, piece of living mechanism, the bloodstream, the lungs and so forth, all working hard and consistently in a human body to maintain life. And yet, so wonderfully is this done, it's unnoticed by us and happens subconsciously and we only really notice it if something goes wrong or we become sick. How can this be all of chance, is what that question we ask. The Bible teaches that man was made for the glory of God and was given an intellect to reflect his glory. And one of the marvellous mechanisms of the body to consider and that which takes in the light given by the sun comes in through the eyes. And scientists tell us that light is discrete bundles of energy or small wavelengths and that we can see uh, the spectrum when the rain falls through a, a, uh, a rainbow. But this light reflects onto the retina at the back of the eye. And we can then, through our sight, appreciate the light and the colour through the sight of our eyes. And there's a delicate membrane at the back of the eyes that vibrates at the distinct increment of the light. And to it, for it to be able to see violet, the shortest of the waves of light, the retina vibrates at a tremendous rate of 75,000, thousand, thousand, thousand vibrations per second. And so no wonder the psalmist declared of the Creator, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. This is from Psalm 139, verse 14. When you consider the beehive, when you consider many of these things in nature, the creation of God, it is beyond all doubt, we believe, that this could come about by chance. And the exact angles within the honeycomb to be able to make the maximum strength, to have the greatest efficiency of materials and the angles that need to be so exact each time to get that, that, that strength in the wax is so precise that it really cannot be anything else but intellectual design. The Bible reveals its purpose on the earth. The Bible tells us in Numbers 14 and at verse 21, the whole earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the creator of heaven and earth. And this is why we believe in creation. We believe that the Bible tells us further the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth to set up his kingdom as prophesied. And it will come about as reliably and as certain as, as other prophecies in the past. And as surely as night follows day, the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth. Thank you.